so, so today we're going to cover um, uh, quite a bit about uh, dependency management. That's what I call the session. Um, but it could just be about uh, setting up your computer or, or something uh, like that. But uh, it's the background of realizing or the realization that um, uh, getting uh, your computational environment uh, all set up is it's often not trivial. And, um, it's not uh, isolated or it's, you know, it's not specific to bioinformatics. Uh, I think it's something that um, uh, anyone doing computational work uh, has had to grapple with and develop us as well. And uh, over time, there have been uh, a couple of suggestions and uh, implementations uh, as well as uh, approaches. And um, I think uh, most of it depends uh, sometimes on what you're working on and uh, what platform uh, you are on or what computational device. Uh, and in some instances, uh, uh, operating system uh, you're on. And often in science, uh, we want to do uh, reproducible science. Uh, we want to be able to uh, say that I did X and Y, and these are the steps that I did, these are the steps that I carried out. And uh, if I share that with you uh, or with someone else, uh, they should be able to reproduce uh, the same exact results uh, that are obtained uh, in my experiment. And that's very, very important. Uh, but it turns out to be not so easy uh, in computing uh, because uh, you've got a really difficult uh, terrain um, in the sense that uh, there are so many developers, um, uh, there are so many tools, and each of those tools have uh, been uh, uh, developed uh, sometimes uh, continuously. So if I wanted to carry out a uh, reads alignment and I'm going to use a uh, minimal, and I say, well, I use minimal, that's great. I go ahead and, and install minimal, and then um, Henley, um, next week, uh, releases a new version of minimal. Uh, and uh, I'm still continuing with my work. I could tell, you could ask me, well, what did you use for your software installation or for your read alignment? I say I used minimal. And uh, you go ahead and install your new minimal, but then you have a version bump. You are working with a more recent software tool uh, than I am working with. And uh, that can create uh, differences. Um, and it also turns out that uh, uh, those tools, to make that tool, uh, often what we call to compile that tool, if you're working with sort of uh, Linux C based uh, tooling, um, it's not trivial either. Uh, you require additional resources. And uh, for you to do that, then uh, those resources are also dependent on other tools. And uh, very quickly, uh, you run into what you call dependency help, uh, in the sense that uh, every other single tool is dependent on another tool, and you, you can't have the same environment, the same computing environment. And uh, sometimes this can be really difficult, uh, again, in the account it, uh, particularly depending on the task. So I, I just gave an example uh, of using reads alignment. Um, well, well, let's take a step back and uh, let's look at another scenario. Uh, you're a scientist, this time you're maybe a particle scientist or physicist, and uh, you need to uh, communicate uh, uh, with the Hubble telescope that is um, off, is, is it the Hubble telescope that is on its way in the interstellar uh, space, right? So a millisecond uh, or a change in your floating point calculation can mean a lot, can make significant differences uh, depending on what you're doing, you know? So, for you to receive that signal and you compute uh, uh, a floating point number uh, at three decimal places or three significant figures, whatever you call it, um, just a change can make can have significant impact uh, on your work. Okay, so um, you may want to ensure that uh, your environment is exactly identical uh, to reproduce some of these uh, findings. So, uh, with that, um, this is what I was trying to illustrate. Uh, this figure here, this idea that uh, we're carrying out research. And uh, that could be uh, whatever it is, and uh, research uh, often uh, generates data. And uh, you going, or we're going to work with this data, manipulate them using software, and um, I'm 
using that in a very broad sense. And once you do that, uh, you're going to get uh, results uh, that you want to write uh, as a manuscript, potentially, or a publication, or whatever it is. And it turns out that uh, there's a lot of trouble here uh, at the software stage, because uh, how do you ensure that you have a reproducible environment? How do you ensure that your reviewers uh, can actually follow the process uh, through which you use to uh, massage your data or do your data analysis? And um, right now, I think a lot of journals uh, ensure or will request that um, all the results uh, be reproducible. And uh, they'll ask you, where is your code base? How is your analysis? You know, uh, a couple of years, maybe a decade or two decades ago, uh, that was never an issue. And if, if you read a lot of papers, uh, you know, 2010 going backwards, uh, you find a lot of instances where uh, in the mental section, you say, uh, we used in-house scripts to do X, Y, Z. So right now that will, will not pass. So if you, if you write that in, you know, in one of the leading channels and you say, uh, we used our uh, in-house scripts or we used, uh, we analyzed or we wrote a Python script. Uh, the question is that, uh, where is that Python script? Uh, people want to see it. And uh, not just to see it, they want to reanalyze your data to ensure that uh, it's actually working. So essentially, how do we ensure that we can create this uh, environment? How do we, uh, ensure reproducibility. I uh, want to get our papers out, but also to ensure that uh, anyone who comes around can uh, reanalyze our results. And uh, we also want to version uh, those tools because, in some instances, uh, methods will change. And uh, what you want is to create an analysis and a version it, uh, or, or create a timestamp uh, uh, that uh, you know that or you can you can share with uh, with someone. Okay. And uh, uh, previously, this is what I was trying to illustrate. Uh, so you got uh, my tool. Uh, it could be anything, uh, you know, some tools, uh, minimal BWA. And BWA uh, depends on the GCC compiler uh, for you to compile it. And uh, it also uh, does depend uh, on make, which is uh, basically a tool. Uh, make, again, has uh, other dependencies. So here, I just use my tool, a uh, sort of generic to illustrate how uh, complicated that environment uh, can be. Um, and um, faced with this sort of uh, situation, what, what, what can we do? Uh, so my next one was sort of uh, um, an exercise. Um, and I think I, I might be the one just to carry out this exercise uh, for now, uh, because I'm not sure whether uh, we have a, a dependence of, on, on our environment. Uh, already, whether you're using your computing or not. Um, but this is what I'm trying to illustrate. So I want to work with BWA. It's a great tool, uh, and I choose it for a reason, uh, that it's all C, um, and I think uh, uh, one of the best tools uh, out there in terms of uh, uh, packaging. And uh, the first thing we want to do is that we want to um, go to that website uh, just to see, uh, you know, to illustrate uh, how this works. So, uh, what I'll do here, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna pull out uh, a shell here. I'll show you in a minute. Sure that it is visible here. Don't, don't worry about this. We will cover a lot of what I'm just going to do shortly. Um, but I use this to illustrate uh, this concept here. And essentially, what I want to do is to spin a bare bones um, a Linux uh, diaspora. Um, so what I'll do here um, is I'm going to take uh, uh, this, this number here. Uh, we'll We'll learn a little bit about these numbers tomorrow, or maybe later in the afternoon. Um, just gonna paste that number there. So I'll not explain what I'm doing here. Uh, maybe if you use this, you already know what I'm doing, but I will cover a bit of this uh, a little today or tomorrow. But essentially, uh, what I have here 
is uh, a bare bones uh, Linux diastro. Uh, I'm on a Mac OS, uh, but I'm I've spun out a uh, Linux uh, diastro uh, Alpine, uh, which is very minimal. Uh, basically, it has nothing uh, in it, and um, I want to install a BWP. Uh, so, as I last illustrated, um, we are going to go to um, the BWA um, uh, website. So, I'll just pull my browser here, uh, pull out a new window, dash here. And therefore, uh, the first thing is that my implementation want to do uh, will be uh, to go to GitHub, uh, where the source code uh, is, and I want to install this tool. Uh, so uh, for us to do that, what we're going to do, often uh, with most of these tools, a uh, uh, lot of providers uh, will have a sort of a get started or an installation <coughs> to tell you uh, how to use this tool. Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, we told uh, you need to clone uh, or to copy uh, the source code. So I'm going to do that. So I'm um, going to follow these instructions. Yeah, it says that I need to uh, clone that into my uh, repository, uh, into my um, uh, into my um, uh, Linux machine. And therefore, I'm going to run that piece of code there. I'm just going to copy it. <coughs> It works. Okay, there we go. So, I uh, just said, you know, as the instructions uh, told me, uh, I ran that and it tells me uh, git not found. So, I'm now stuck, right? Right from the beginning. So, what am I going to do? So, uh, let's see. Uh, what that tells us is that we need to install this uh, tool. Um, it's, a, it's a versioning tool and therefore we need to install it. Now, um, I'm not very familiar with Alpine Linux, but I got an idea of how to install the tools. And therefore, we're going to use an Alpine uh, package manager uh, called uh, APK. And uh, we ask APK to, uh, to install using the add command JT uh, uh, git. Okay? And it does it. So it starts to install. Now, look what's happening. So, as it's doing this, it's adding dependencies. And each of those has uh, references. Now remember, we are still very far away uh, from installing our awesome tool, BWA. Uh, and now, already, uh, we need to install this tool in the first instance. And uh, we can see that uh, doing it, uh, uh, we are adding uh, more and more dependencies. Uh, this problem here. So, yeah, there you go. So we added 20 uh, uh, megabytes and we installed 25 packages. Uh, we thought we were installing one package. Turns out it's 25 of them. Okay, so uh, then uh, we'll be like, okay, cool. Uh, this is really nice. So let's go back. I'll just do that. And uh, let's clone this repository. And now it works. Okay, so... Uh, we're now copying this tool uh, into our, in this case, root directory, really, uh, which you shouldn't do, but we're going to do it anyway, just to last week. So as you can see, uh, we're now um, trying to, to copy it, and uh, everything is done. Uh, we've copied all the source code. And uh, what I'm going to do next is to try and uh, follow the instructions. Uh, now that I have the tool, I would assume that uh, um, uh, it's existing up in a browser, and I need uh, to, if you remember, Peter yesterday was showing us how to uh, use uh, Linux. So we're going to use this command uh, cd, uh, which is a change directory. Okay. And so we're going to change directory to bwa. Right? Uh, if I use clear there, just so sort of good there. Can we all see that? Right? It's always there. So the next thing I'm going to do uh, is that uh, there's a set of instructions uh, on how to make the binary uh, for this tool. And uh, there's another tool uh, within sort of Linux Unix system uh, that 
uh, follows those set of instructions. Um, and it's called the make command or the make tool. So uh, we're going to use make. And if you just type make within our directory, uh, it should work. Oops, make is not there. Okay, so I thought I had everything in, and now it turns out I don't. Uh, so make not found. Uh, what should I do? Uh, do I install make? Yeah, or what, what, what should happen here now? Okay, so it turns out that we need this tool, um, and for us to get it, um, it actually it depends on a lot of other things. So if you're a Linux system administrator or you work with the installing tools, uh, you need to install uh, one more tooling uh, called uh, the GCC compiler. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And uh, we're gonna use apk add uh, GCC. Okay. Okay, uh, so again now, uh, more tools being installed as we're installing this uh, uh, compiler. Uh, just so that uh, we uh, we can get the make command. Okay, so let's try again uh, um, and do make. Right, uh, make not found. I think we need to um, add it. Um, there we go. It's installed make. Uh, I had to install the GCC because it's an it's an entire tool chain. Uh, and therefore, make and GCC uh, 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 work together. So let's now uh, run this. I just using uh, the arrow key or the tab key to go back to my previous command. There we go. Now it's working, but uh, it's running into an error because uh, this file here, this header file, can't be found. Right. So. Uh, uh, this is a, a C code, uh, it says include uh, the uh, standard uh, input output uh, dot H, which is uh, an important header file, but it looks like it's not installed. Uh, so even when we have all this tool chain with all, uh, all grid, uh, we, we're running into uh, uh, some bit of trouble. Uh, and therefore, um, it turns out that uh, uh, it lives in a separate, that for those header files, we need to install them. Uh, from the uh, from the C library, um, and um, that's what we're gonna do. Uh, don't know. So I think like I'm struggling changing between this. Okay, there we go. Uh, so again, um, we're going to do the APK um, add. Um, it lives in the C library, which we more we will need to install, and it's called the uh, libcd. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's a development library, but um, that is what is going to give us uh, this file here. Okay. Um, so there we go. Uh, I think we are good to go now. Uh, let's do it. Oops. No. We need another dependency. In this case, uh, the zlib uh, file, uh, make file. Right. So you start again because uh, it turns out that that also lives uh, in the uh, Z library uh, uh, dev. So we need to install that, okay? So let's go again. Um, so uh, we need uh, the Z lib. So we just want to see. Um, we need the div environment. And now it's installed. And then again, we're going to run make. And this time around, our uh, make is happy. Okay, so we've satisfied all the dependencies, um, and uh, hopefully our library has compiled uh, the the binary. Uh, yes, please. Just wanted to check Yes, so um, so there was a reason I chose the Alpine, and I chose it because it's bare bones. It's the smallest Linux diaspora you can actually get. And uh, if you really want to learn uh, tooling, uh, I usually recommend it because it comes with nothing. Literally, it's just a, a kernel and a few libraries, and that's it. Um, Ubuntu, uh, you could do, and um, 
uh, what I would have done, I would have uh, installed the, uh, the setup tools, you know, and I'll just do uh, apt install uh, the, uh, uh, the tool chain and immediately I have uh, everything. But I do want to illustrate this process just to take us uh, step by step. And then we'll see how to actually do this uh, really magically without worrying about it. Okay. Yeah. So this is that has worked. Um, and if I ls in my current directory, I can see, well, I'm using uh, this shell. I see a, a binary here uh, and a couple of binaries. And therefore, uh, my tool has compiled. And what I could do, I could try, try and uh, uh, run it. Okay. So with that we end. And voila, it works. Okay. So now I can do my alignment. I can do what I want to do. But uh, you can see the path. Uh, uh, that has taken us. And it's not trivial, it's not easy. Um, and and that, that was the point that I wanted to, uh, to illustrate, uh, that installing tools is difficult. And uh, often in our institutes, um, uh, you are the point of contact uh, for doing this. Uh, and you often will get stuck. In some institutes, uh, uh, if they have a slightly bigger budget, uh, you have a systems administrator. Uh, and therefore, um, as a bioinformatician, you could just go straight to the system administrator and tell them, uh, kindly, could you install me uh, this tool? And they will install it for you. And therefore, I don't have to worry about it. Okay? Uh, but I, also, I always think that uh, as a bioinformatician, it's really important for us to learn this, uh, this approach. Okay? And that's sort of the, uh, the long way. Uh, but you can also see how uh, successfully doing it uh, depends also on your uh, other skill sets. Uh, for example, how did I know uh, where to get ahead of us? You know, uh, how do you search for it now? I mean, you could go to Stack Overflow. Um, you could, I think now you can ask ChatGPT uh, where H. It'll give you some solutions. Uh, they may not be very optimal. I think I'll, I'll try it. Um, but um, you know, that that that, that that's uh, uh, that, that's quite difficult. So. Um, the point that I wanted to, uh, to raise there uh, was that uh, it's, uh, uh, it's difficult to install software. Uh, you can also see how much time I spent. And if I didn't know exactly what steps and where to find things, uh, I would also have trouble because I have to either go to Stack Overflow, ask colleagues, ask people, go to the forums maybe, uh, and then uh, you get it all done. And then someone else, like, uh, she provided a solution. Why don't, why don't you just use that? They do it too, uh, uh, OS. And um, uh, again, uh, that can make work a little uh, bit easier. Uh, but then we'll see even uh, how to make it even more easy uh, using uh, Kodak. So um, what I've done, really, uh, there's a bit of cheating involved uh, in that. Um, in the sense that uh, I used APK, which is a package manager, uh, already uh, uh, written, and, you know, it's, a, it's also a repository, uh, and that made it really easy for me to do this installation, okay? It's because somebody has already outlined these uh, procedures and processes. Uh, but uh, the, my aim here was to sort of uh, take a step back of uh, history and, and understand about this and how that has been addressed, you know, so software dependencies is a, is a core problem for computing, for software developers. And uh, initially, I think uh, back in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, uh, to I think the 2010s, and even now, uh, a lot of tools would be uh, packaged in what you call uh, tables. Okay? Um, and the table is simply a compressed archive uh, that has all your tools and the instructions on how to uh, install those tools. It does also make some assumptions uh, on the target environments where you want to install your tool. Okay, so um, often it will tell you uh, this is for an X386 architecture, or this is for an ARM architecture, uh, this is for a 64-bit, this is for Windows, this is for uh, Mac OS, and, and, and others. And therefore, if you are the developer, uh, you want to distribute your tool, uh, you either have to make multiple tables or make, use a, a multiple uh, targets. Uh, in your instruction code as you distributing uh, your, 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 your tool. And that often is not uh, easy. Uh, so the other way to, uh, to do it, so historically tables have been used, and even now um, they're still uh, quite in use. Uh, and another way is to do uh, 
has to work with the uh, packet managers. So, um, this was just, uh, I just said, you know, the table, um, you have your code, you got your configuration file, uh, you have a script uh, that uh, shows you how to compile and uh, scripts to install the, the code. So uh, in my illustration, we compiled BWA in the same directory, right? Where the source code is. That's usually not a good idea, okay? Uh, often you want to take your binaries and put them uh, in a separate folder, okay? Uh, often it's under the slash USR uh, slash bin directory or lib bin uh, in, in, in most Linux installations. Um, um, and sometimes you can um, just create your, your slash bin uh, library. I do that a lot, um, and I put all my binaries uh, in that in that folder, just so that I isolate them from the source code. Because uh, once I compile it, I don't need the source code often. Uh, so I'm more interested with the, with the binary, and I want it somewhere where I can reach it quite easily uh, on the bash, uh, on, on my bash uh, configuration or zish uh, configuration. So uh, the time to install, you see, uh, you know, we, we took quite some bit of time. Um, so if time was of essence, um, we'll, we'll fail on that, um, you know, in terms of the steps we had to take and the time we wrote. And uh, you will have conflicts uh, with other existing tools, okay? So if I try to compile this uh, on a system that already has BWA, it's gonna create conflicts. I also may have conflicts with multiple GCC versions that often get uh, released, and they can be a lot of um, a significant updates between uh, our compilers or, or make, make, make utilities. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, you'll have to deal with that as a, as a, as a developer. Uh, the other thing I did uh, when I was on this tool, I compiled the tool uh, in the root directory, which is really, really wrong. Uh, you, you shouldn't do that. You know, the better thing would have for me to go to the uh, home directory uh, uh, and, and, and install it there, but um, I, I did it. Um, so, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I have a question. So, yeah. if you are going to fill, going to fill this in that of public field, uh, um, which kind of tool and which kind of uh, uh, source code, I mean, with the habit of what uh, tool to use to, uh, uh, to install for the packet, what isn't it possible to store or uh, all the tools in a uh, text file that will uh, you code in once you require to install it as, uh, some list of dependencies, just like you've done in Python, and so they can comment.txt file to, I mean, once you can install that requirement to, to, to run them as a package, it's not possible to do that in a docker. Yes, I will, and we'll come to that. Yeah. Uh, so this is sort of uh, taking a, a bit of a step to know where we are, where we're coming from, and then uh, we will um, actually do that uh, yeah, in the next couple of minutes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, exactly, that, that, that's all that. So uh, another way to do this uh, is to use package managers. So I just did that uh, on the Alpine Linux, we got uh, APK, uh, and on different uh, Linux distributions, uh, they all come with their package managers, okay? Uh, so uh, some of them is uh, are apt uh, for Ubuntu, um, uh, like, uh, operating systems, uh, YAM uh, for uh, Red Hat, uh, CentOS, um, uh, Rocky Linux, and uh, Alma Linux, uh, all sort of Red Hat derived operating systems um, tend to use YAM and APK for Alpine. Uh, but this concept has also been borrowed uh, for programming languages. Okay, uh, So if you work with PAL, for example, uh, this CPAN, the Comprehensive uh, PAL uh, Archive Network, uh, because uh, you may want to download a tool uh, or a package to carry out uh, a specific uh, uh, task and you need uh, to install uh, that tool. So once you have PAL installed on your system, um, it almost, I think it comes with the CPAN as well, or you can install CPAN separately. And uh, that will be your package uh, manager uh, for you. Uh, if you're working with Python, um, Coda, and we're gonna look at that. Uh, 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 P P3, I think, yeah. Um, and uh, Homebrew is another one, particularly uh, really useful if you're on uh, Mac OS like uh, operating systems. Uh, although Mac OS is uh, Unix, it has deviated significantly, uh, you know, from 
some of the uh, 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 ideas of, you know, of, of Linux. So uh, it, 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 it's, it's Unix, but you know, it has its own proprietary uh, issues and uh, control systems. And therefore, it used to come with all these setup tools. And then I think Apple at some point said, no, we're not going to deal with that. Uh, we take this target. Uh, and therefore, as a developer, uh, you need to set up your operating system uh, uh, for those that work on uh, Mac OS like uh, devices. Uh, then uh, Homebrew is a really great alternative package manager. And you can use it to install a lot of the open source uh, uh, package managers. So uh, whenever I get um, my Mac, uh, I will install Homebrew uh, just so that I have the uh, developer tools uh, to allow me to install other tools. Uh, if you're working with um, other programming languages, uh, Ruby, Ruby has Ruby Gems. Uh, if you're working with uh, Julia, uh, they have the Julia package manager, I don't know what it's called, but it's there, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, another way to think about it, um, and this was popular a lot, I think, about a decade ago, yes, yeah. um, for a two, I don't know whether to call it a two or a package, for something like Nextflow. Is it a package manager and how different is it from this package? Um, what, what, uh, that's a workflow or pipeline development um, tool, uh, you know, akin to a snake make. And Boros is uh, uh, historically, you uh, draw some borrow from, uh, from C make and, and make. Uh, yeah, so it's within those, uh, you know, sort of a pipeline uh, development uh, managers. You that's a workflow manager. That's a workflow manager. Yes, yes. It, you know, it's not a package manager. It's you know, um, it's something that helping you to uh, carry out the task. Uh, you know, and you know, you can write all those tasks in a reproducible way. Well, I don't think we have time to do that. Oh, um, Juma, I'm going to talk to us about next flow um, tomorrow or maybe uh, today. Yeah, most likely, tomorrow. I'm going to look at next flow. Yes. Okay, so uh, another way to think about it, and that I think uh, so a lot of development went in. Yes, please. Yeah, I think just to maybe add to what you're saying, the, I think the way I, I simplify it is at this level where we are, we're looking at the individual tools to carry out the task. So, an example I gave at the beginning is people who so that's a tool for the public But you, you want to, you don't want to carry out one task at a time. You want to maybe do it, map your links, and maybe do a variant column. So those are two different tasks. So that, when you come to that, you want to move from this task of mapping to variant coding to very variant depending on how you want to align the way, that's where now you need another bigger higher level tool now that puts that into a workflow. And that those are the examples that you give uh, the explore of the safety and whatnot. So they are kind of then they they work to use those tools sort of in, in a workflow pipeline so that they probably can get the output from one tool send it to the next, send it to the next, and out here to give you an end output. I think for me, kind of easier when I look at it like that. Okay. Yeah. So at this level, we are looking at individual tools and how you will manage. But then you gave an example that at the beginning, just one tool has you know, all these other things, so it's way that you need for that tool to work. As the way you to do. And that is where now you have these that help you manage those other software that that particular leader needed to meet for it to be the key market. Yeah, thank you. It's perfectly Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Very nice, uh, concise uh, description. Uh, yes, indeed. So, um, another way to think about this and I think a lot of this again was um, a lot of uh, great developments in the um, early start of this decade and the late um, sort of uh, late 90s uh, was around uh, 
hardware abstraction um, uh, in what they call uh, virtual machines. Uh, and there was a lot of development around that. And I think as uh, late as uh, 2010, there was the idea of uh, hypervisors, for example. You know? So these are like uh, tools that uh, abstract the hardware and uh, create these um, uh, systems that can share resources. Uh, but uh, they can be quite expensive to set up, difficult some, in some instances, uh, and uh, not very optimal in terms of uh, resource uh, utilization. Uh, but they turned out to be really great in terms of uh, isolating uh, work environments and uh, ensuring that um, a hardware uh, can support a myriad uh, operating systems uh, uh, and uh, work uh, 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 workflows and so on and so forth. So uh, you, you can imagine, um, you know, as a big university or as a research institute, uh, you make uh, investments in terms of hardware, right? So IT purchase hardware. And uh, what you don't want to do is purchase hardware for every operating system, okay, for every task that you need. So the idea was, can you abstract the hardware? Uh, because the operating systems are, you know, you could think of them as applications, really, uh, only at the very, uh, you know, uh, heart of the metal. Uh, and you could abstract that. So, um, you know, a lot of developments were made around this, uh, but then... Uh, Sometimes later, um, um, I think in the last decade, uh, came the idea of uh, uh, containers. But it's not really a novel idea uh, because uh, it has always been there. And for people who've used um, Unix systems uh, they, and Linux systems, they already knew about this. But uh, 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 there was a, a big development around you know, utilizing that system uh, to create what were called uh, containers. We're going to come to that. Yes, please. Um, can you explain what abstraction is? Abstraction is um, I'm not an English person, but what it means is um, if can I give an analogy? Um, let's say uh, how do I do this? Um, uh, let's say uh, let's say I need to move uh, from one place to another, right? I want to move from one place, and I want to move very fast, right? Uh, what does that mean? I need a vehicle, or I need uh, something, um, a mechanical device, you'd say, uh, that moves me from place A to place B, right? Um, and it turns out that um, uh, he likes to move from place one to place B uh, uh, while, you know, a little bit more comfortable, okay? Uh, so while we have this machine that can take you from place one, a to B, uh, we can make or install a, a bed. And sorry for a very bad sort of idea, but uh, and another one where people sit. Okay, uh, one that can take two people and one that can just have one person, right? At the heart of it is a mechanical device uh, that simply uses fuel or whatnot, moves on four wheels or six wheels, depending. So each of those. Uh, use cases are abstractions of the original mechanical device. Is that clear? So let's come back home a little bit. Uh, operating systems. Okay. So at the bottom of it um, is that we got hardware uh, that <coughs> operates um, on signals, right? Binary, uh, whatnot, right? And uh, we need to carry out our applications. So we want to, you know, carry out a task um, and uh, the only way to do it, I mean, there are multiple ways to do it, and therefore everyone will come with their own uh, solution. Uh, but each of those solutions will be an abstraction uh, of the basic concept, you know. Uh, so whether it's uh, Windows, whether it's um, uh, Linux, whether it's Unix, uh, they are all sort of, when you think about it, they are all abstractions of a, of a common uh, template, if I, if I could use that. And then you've got implementation. So, um, and I think we'll cover that a bit, uh, particularly talking about this, uh, where we're going to have our Docker engine and images uh, that then become containers. Okay? Uh, so that, that, that's essentially what I meant by, by abstraction. And, uh, in software, we, we, we abstract concepts, um, uh, particularly if you're into OOP programming and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you create a, a shell and then uh, you can create multiple instances of the same thing uh, but each of those with different properties. Okay, so if I want to make a ball, 
you know, it's just a ball, but I can have a green ball, I can have a red ball, I can have a yellow ball, I can have an oval. Those are all abstractions of a circle or a ball. Is that clear? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so, and here we are. And what time are we supposed to go for? Uh, 10, 10, 10, 10, 30. 10. still far away? Yeah, yeah, we've got time. Oh, in 10 minutes, okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, so containers are really a great way to do this, and uh, we'll cover quite a bit of that uh, tomorrow. Um, but essentially what we're really looking for is a way to create uh, spaces or unique uh, sandboxes uh, where we can do a lot of what we want. We can install our tools and they don't interfere with each other. Okay? And uh, we also want a tool that we can share uh, across. So I borrowed this image um, from one of the tutorials and I think we will go through uh, some aspect of it. And uh, within it, um, you know, we, we're going to install something that called Coda, um, uh, which itself is a tool out of a mini coder, which again is an encoder. And I don't know why Python and its fascination with snakes and snakes. And snakes. <laughs> <laughs> so Python, you know, a snake, and everything around it is all snakes. An encoder, mini coder, mamba, coder. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. You know, so um, there's, there's quite a lot of, so they call it an anacoda, and it's big, you know, anacoda is such a huge Amazonian uh, snake. Uh, um, and, um, you know, uh, was meant to actually, I think, overcome a problem in Python. Which again, I don't know how Python landed itself there. Uh, I still struggle to know what to use to install a Python library. Should I use setup tools? Should I use PIP? Should I use uh, PIP3? Uh, should I use Coda? Like, it's all different ways. Or you can compile it yourself using uh, setup tools. So uh, they added themselves into a quagmire, I think. Um, and out of that came all sort of solutions. One of them was an encoder uh, that then gets abstracted uh, to Minicoder, which is simply Coda and Python and base packages. Uh, and then you have a Coda uh, environment. And what it's going to do, I think I'll cover this a bit, uh, will be to try and you know, set up a directory and environments uh, that are sandboxes. You know, quite very isolated spaces where you can do your work and that will not interfere uh, with another uh, piece of work. Okay? So you can imagine that uh, today, uh, as I mentioned, I want to use BWA or Minimap to do uh, some assembly. I could be called an assembly, um, but I may also want to do uh, some other work um, for uh, uh, SASPO or uh, something else, right? And those two analyses, although they're using the same set of tools, I don't want to mix and match because the tasks and the goals of those two projects are quite different. Okay? And I could you know, work within my environment and you know, install all these tools, but I'm going to run into uh, issues and uh, crashes uh, later on. And therefore, there's a way that you can abstract it. Within Python, I think they have the virtual, virtual environment or virtual uh, you know, that was used initially to create um, uh, multiple Python uh, distributions uh, uh, and uh, make all of them uh, work quite together and, uh, and, and very well. Okay. So, um, my next exercise was about um, installing this tool here. Um, and I don't know, um, we are working on our computers. Yes. Uh, um, how many of us have code installed already? Uh, so, um, that, that, that's great. Uh, so, I think for, for those of us that don't, it would be nice to um, just go through this so that um, we will be able to uh, install uh, the tool. And here, I made an assumption that we are all uh, on sort of a Linux environment uh, for our computers. I didn't understand some of us, I think, our Windows. And uh, Peter was to help set up the Windows uh, sub Linux subsystem. Is, is, that, is that working now? The Linux uh, Windows Linux subsystem for those of us that are on Windows. I have two, two of you. Okay, so the rest of us are on a Linux <coughs> platform or have access to one. Uh, for those that are on um, sort of a Mac OS, uh, Windows, um, the website here, I'll, I'll simply navigate to the Minicoder website um, and you can see uh, all the instructions. Uh, 
uh, for doing that. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Can they follow the slides that you're showing the instructions from the website? The I'll put up all the material on our website, but yeah, you can. Yeah. Although the, the previous to copy and paste from the website, or is this only visible to them on the screen? It's always going to be to the screen. I've not put it on our course website yet. And I'm just wondering if they want to actually do it there. Right. Yeah. I'll try and push it tonight or tomorrow on our course website. Can you maybe copy and paste it in the Slack? Oh, yes. The instructions. Just that slide. Just that was not slide. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. I'll try and do that. No, they are not on Slack. They have a WhatsApp group. But also on WhatsApp. But my idea was to, to try and follow the instructions. And I don't know whether all of us have internet access. There's a page that you can all access. The one, the, 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 the Google Doc. Right. You can all access that. Okay. So I'll give you a nice page on it. It could be easy using that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. my, my bad. I didn't think a lot about it. So. Um, yeah, so if you, if you don't have it, I'm, I'm happy to help you uh, make the install, but if you navigate it to this website, uh, Docs and Akoda, or simply Google installing Coda or Mini Coda, uh, it will add you on this website. And uh, you see uh, sort of the latest uh, versions, and then if you, uh, if you scroll down, uh, they have these instructions, uh, depending on your platform. Um, so I was trying to review this in the morning just to make sure that it's working. So I was on the uh, Mac OS. I've shared on the WhatsApp page, so you have shared it. What's that? I've shared the link on the WhatsApp page. Okay, cool, excellent. You it. Um, yeah, so you, 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 you use this on Windows. Um, and if you're on a Mac OS, uh, you can use this. So Mac OS is... Um, also different because some of us, I don't know what our Intel, Mac or, or the more newer M1, M2, which are ARM uh, architecture. Uh, so this is for the ARM architecture. And if you're on a Linux platform, uh, you'd use this. Uh, and the idea was for us to uh, simply go through those instructions and just ensure that uh, we, uh, we have this uh, installed in our in our home, uh, in our in our system. So, so I'll just go through what these commands are and what they are going to do. Um, and forgive me if you already know this. So, uh, the first thing I do, uh, one, I'm assuming that you are within your home directory. Uh, I like installing Coda in my home directory, okay? Because it makes it very easy to delete, to remove it, and if I just delete that folder. Um, it's gone, okay? And often in your home directory, uh, you'll have all the rights. If I try to install it in another directory, uh, you may need permissions. And uh, often with software installation, uh, it's always nice to not have, uh, you know, invoke uh, root permissions, okay? Uh, sudo and, and, and others. So I create a directory, uh, minicoda3, uh, in slash home, uh, you can see the tilde, uh, minicoda, and then here you can use uh, curl or wget, uh, which is a utility uh, that often comes with a lot of uh, uh, Unix uh, uh, tools uh, to download and then copy that minus or output that uh, to your minicoder and uh, rename that file uh, to minicoder.sh. Um, and it's always nice uh, if you go through that simply a shell script uh, that has a set of instructions uh, for installing and creating all the directories uh, for uh, installing uh, Coda. Sorry about all this flashing thing here. I was informed that it's going to go away. Um, okay. Um, 
Yep. And then um, you run bash, you execute that uh, script uh, with uh, special permissions. Uh, the minus you will go into update it, um, and uh, it will uh, only do that uh, if you within uh, sort of the mini code directory. And then uh, rm uh, with the rf uh, is to then once you've done it, you can delete uh, the mini sh file. And then um, you need to activate uh, the code environment uh, if you're within Bash. Uh, for those that are on Mac OS, uh, often I think the default uh, shell is uh, the Z shell. Uh, so you just execute uh, init uh, Z shell. Maybe I'll, I'll add that instruction there. Um, and then uh, the lower instruction says to install another tool uh, that works very well with Coda and uh, solves a lot of problems with the initial coder uh, tool um, uh, to install um, and manage your environment. Uh, so Mamba, um, that now lives in its own uh, sort of a directory, is, is really uh, nice and important uh, to manage your coder environment. And I think now um, there's sort of a, a uh, full compatibility between Mamba and Encoda. What you can do with the Coda command, you can do with Mamba. Uh, only that Mamba is uh, working works in parallel, uh, so it turns out to be very fast and it can recursively work through your directory uh, much, much, much quicker and faster uh, relative to uh, Coda, uh, which I think with the popularity of Coda, uh, a lot of issues uh, emerged uh, around uh, dependency uh, management. Okay, so maybe I'll stop there, we can go on a break, and then when we come, uh, we'll work on this, uh, do the installation, um, and then uh, uh, go through setting up uh, a code environment, uh, work in and uh, see examples of installing that tool, uh, and then how can we uh, share those, uh, those environments uh, with, with colleagues. And maybe, I think if we have time, we can also see how to package uh, tools as part of um, uh, Coda. And, yeah. Okay. Um, so, this one is based on uh, past experience and uh, previous work. Yeah. So, I needed to run a workflow and it was a uh, dockerized uh, workflow. It was in Docker. And then you installed Docker. And it happened that that server did not have Docker. So, I contacted the system server. And he refused to install Docker. He told me to use Singularity as an alternative. And he cited security issues and all that. And I, I didn't understand. You know, at that time, I was only interested in getting correct up. So uh, I think we, we, we had quite a back and forth then. So I want to, based on that, I just want to ask, is there a security risk for us as bioinformaticians to use Docker? If it would result in a system suddenly not, not allowing it to be installed, you know, um, on the server for use. Yeah, um, yeah, good. So, and uh, I really like your system administrator. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, so Docker has a security issue, uh, so you don't want to install uh, Docker on uh, on a HPC. And the reason is because of the. Um, the way <coughs> the processes through which uh, Docker uses uh, and how it abstracts the operating system to actually create those uh, environments. I think we'll talk a little bit about that maybe tomorrow uh, when we go through Docker. Uh, but if you want to do the same thing uh, on a HPC, uh, you will install Singularity, uh, which you know works just like Docker. Pretty much, Singularity will work with Docker images. Uh, and it's much more, more secure. So a lot of system administrators only install Singularity on the HPC. Now on your machine, again, it will often assume you know, your computer is your computer. Uh, it's not for multiple users. So the system administrator on a HPC is worried about everybody else. And uh, therefore, you know, the resource uh, is not for you, you know, so it's for everyone else. Uh, so they'll probably refuse to install Docker. Uh, on, on it because mm -hmm. uh, it compromises on uh, system security. But singularity doesn't. Uh, yeah. And in, in real secure systems, neither singularity or Docker will be installed uh, on some of these uh, HPC. Yeah. 
depending on it. So in, in such a case, how, how do you get around it? Because sometimes you may have a certain workflow in which has been containerized in one of these, or using one of these options. And then you, you go to an institute where they tell you, well, here we don't do this so And then you need to run or do an analysis with that workflow. Based on if I think maybe the data is small, you could manage on your own. Yeah, yeah, on your computer. It's, it's high throughput. So in that case, what do you do? What's the solution or workaround? Yeah, so one, I mean, yeah, it can be difficult because you have to respect a lot of the IT policies in an organization um, uh, or learn how to work with them. Uh, but in some instances, I'll just uh, maybe at that point may, may make use uh, or make sense to uh, simply uh, spin. Uh, 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 a service on the, on the cloud. Uh, so, for example, I can go to um, one of the several providers, Linode, for example. Uh, you know, at a very low cost, I can you know set up an entire service there. Uh, you know, get the work done and out. Uh, I can use Amazon Cloud Services. Uh, that's another solution. Google Cloud Services. Uh, all again, as you say, depending on the task, you could ask. You know, can I do this? So most Actually, if you look at it, uh, most computing hardware is, is really high end, and um, often, and this is something I've worked with people where they say, "Well, I got this tool, but it's taking uh, too long." And then we walk through <coughs> the the tool, and I realize a lot of um, wastage of resources. Okay. For example, you're using some tools. Uh, why do you want to save dot uh, sum file? Why don't you align? and directly create a bound file. And once that bound file, you've done what you want to do with it, delete it, you don't need it. Because you have the workflow, you can always regenerate it in the future, okay? So I see a lot of people saying, well, I've got these bound files that I'm storing on the system, I need storage. No, you don't. All you need is your raw reads, okay? That's all you need. You don't need that much storage, okay? And you just do the alignment, you write your script, um, each of those steps, um, try not to store some files, they are huge, and in any case, you're going to convert them to bound files, so convert them on the fly, uh, get your bound files, do your variant calling, delete the bound files, and at the end of the day, you have a 10 KB file, that's all you need. You know, if you're working with uh, pathogenic genomes, you rarely ever will have a 1 terabyte or a 100 gig uh, output file. If you're working with the human genome and others, you know, you can get quite relatively huge files uh, um, are coming out of that. You know, and then after that, you know, you go to your R and whatever, and you know, uh, summarize your finding in a file that is about three KB uh, image. So it's just understanding that process and what resources you really need. Uh, sometimes you really don't need that much resources. And the other one is to look between: uh, is it is it what I'm doing? Is it memory intensive or is it compute intensive? And now, is it GPU? Um, uh, uh, intensive. So if I'm doing anything that machine learning, sort of uh, neural networks, I need the GPU. Uh, in other instances, I just need the CPU. Okay, but then for CPU uh, related jobs, um, they could be memory heavy. Like if you're doing Blast, for example, like what we just talked about, piping data uh, from you know the liner, um, no sum, straight to bound, straight to you know you could use the pipes. Uh, so for that, what you really care about. Uh, is a memory. Okay, so your server just needs to have a sufficient memory and you know you can do things that way. That's it. Thank you. Yes. I would just say this may be a response. Um, but I think the way we solve it here at Sandy and the other issues that is not really true is the system is administrative and you're supposed to ask you the explore the training line. And then you can install all the software that allow you to do your doctorate and everything on there. So is he not is he not giving you that option? Yeah, that option was there, but it happened that to install the Docker at the time I needed uh, administrative privileges. But I needed to use the CDU. And he wasn't able to give me that. He told me. But on the virtual environment are you not? No, even in the virtual environment they still required a user the CDU. To, to complete the installation. So at that time, so I was quite new to it. So I, I just wanted, I told him, just give me the studio and then. <laughs>
So, uh, as a quiz, and just maybe for some of us that um, a little bit maybe advanced, uh, have a question: How um, how do you create a, a virtual environment uh, in a Linux system, uh, making um, use of our existing uh, utilities? Uh, maybe something to, to, to discuss, or maybe, maybe my, well, I don't think my question is very clear. Anyway, it turns out that uh, uh, within uh, Linux uh, and Unix environments, uh, it is possible to create um, uh, an environment uh, outside of the core environment using a uh, command. Um, okay, maybe I will just mention it. Uh, who, who of us is familiar with uh, ch root? Command. <laughs> Yeah, Peter <laughs> might, might be very fascinated by this, I'm sure. But it turns out that um, you can, so in most uh, Unix uh, environments, in most Unix environments, it turns out that uh, we have this folder. Uh, which is the root uh, for the operating system. It always looks for that. And uh, it turns out that uh, commands like bash, so you saw that, you know, we do the uh, bin bash. And um, this command, uh, this utility, um, looks for where uh, root is. But we can redirect the operating system and bash to work in a non-root environment and abstract the resources such that the operating system, uh, when you're working in that directory, does not know or will assume not to know uh, anything outside of the uh, root direct or outside of that directory. Uh, something they call uh, jail, um, right? So, yeah. So you literally put bash in jail, so to speak, uh, and you only work within that directory. And it turns out to be a really nice and clever way uh, to abstract and run things on a Unix directory. And the processes will also not be aware um, of what you're doing. So a nice way to hack systems and run your things. The system administrator, and this allows you to do things. Yeah. So, so sorry, what did you just start to see it to me? Let me just show this. Um, uh, maybe, oh yeah, it, okay, let, me, let me see, I'm going to pull up uh, an article, that's really nice, I'll put it in the resources uh, folder, uh, yeah, I got it, here, so, okay, so I mean here, uh, the ch root command, it's, it's, it's really powerful, um, um, and over here, what is happening, yeah, let's try to do that. How do you do this? Okay, then. Yeah. So what, what is happening here 
uh, is that we make in a new directory in a TMP, which is a temporary folder, and we are calling it a new root, and then we are copying the bash to new root, and then uh, we're going to execute bash uh, in there, and it will literally uh, execute uh, that tool or whatever you want to do uh, in a sort of a, of a jail. And this, this article is really, really nice. Um, if you, I'll put it up here. So for example, uh, over here, you know, it's showing you uh, how to create a C root jail. Uh, essentially, is how to create an uh, isolated environment. And this one is just using uh, Unix Linux uh, resources. You don't have to install anything. Okay? But these concepts and these ideas are what brought us to Docker and containers and others, you know, making use of you know this existing. Does anything have to have sudo whatever? Um, to do this. Uh, no, using HP, you're using not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, because you can create this. So the only thing is, um, if, yeah, I don't know whether you need when you put the CD to copy whether they need root, but now. Uh, it will create a directory here in a sort of a root directory. Okay. Anyway, I'll share this with us for those that are interested. Um, I find this utility is quite, quite useful. Um, and uh, the more reason I, I really love uh, sort of Unix Linux. And so then you just exit that, is everything lost? It will execute within that directory. So, but I still have three strings there. Yeah, it's yeah, you know, it the okay. just redirected it um, uh, the operating system of you know within that instance to think that a slash root lives in your new directory. So that becomes sort of the <coughs> the root directory, uh, so to speak. But it has all the low level packages yes. No, it doesn't have all that. So it it's, it's a virtual environment when you really think about it, that you're creating uh, to run or to carry out uh, some specific tasks. So if you if you need them to do lots of other things, you may have to copy them in that direction. So for this instance, I'm training at my institute, and I want people with Linux access various things with the without really interfering with other things within the system. Can you create it and then maybe they can do it? No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yes, uh, but um, it's just a utility that I thought I should mention. It. I'll put this up on our notes as well. Um, but it's interesting. Right. So maybe we can go for uh, for T, and then when we come back, uh, we can uh, explore the, the installation. <laughs>